Welcome to TFR Let's Talk. I'm your host, Swapnil Bharatiya, and my next guest is Golden Andrews, co founder and CEO of Gremlin. Golden, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. We have hosted Gremlin so many times, but I would give you the opportunity to just quickly tell us what is Gremlin all about. Yeah, Gremlin was born from a need at my time at Amazon and Netflix to build reliable systems and manage the complexity of the cloud. And so in a nutshell, it's chaos engineering as a service. It's a platform to help customers build more reliable software. Since you mentioned, you know, uh, kind of you touched upon the original history, I would also love to know the origin uh, or, or, you know, when did it, this whole idea of chaos engineering came to exist? When I was at Amazon in 2009, we, again, were struggling with this problem and the microservice architectures and the complexity. And we were already doing a bunch of manual game days. Uh, Jesse Robbins was an early availability leader at Amazon, and he came with a firefighter EMT background. And so he focused a lot on training the organization for incident response and preparing for that. And so we took that and we built a product around it. We built a, a web an internal service. We built internal tooling. We did a lot more than just rebooting hosts. We were taking up CPU and disk. We were messing with the network. Uh, DynamoDB was one of my early internal customers, and they did a lot of testing around how they handled network partitions, and they found and fixed some important bugs before they went live. And so I, no, not to take credit away from Netflix, uh, they, they coined the term chaos engineering with chaos monkey. And after my time at Amazon, you know, it was the end of my time of Amazon is when Netflix started speaking about this. And I said, great, this is a place I can go and learn more. And so I went and I joined Netflix and I didn't write Chaos Monkey. I didn't do that early work. But what I found was there was an opportunity to build upon that. Folks were hungry for a safer solution, a non-chaotic solution. And so instead of building more Chaos Monkeys, we built uh, an application level fault injection platform called FIT. And what that did, long and short, was it allowed any engineer to go inject failure at any connection in the system and down to a user or a single request level. So that was key for really making it safe. If we talk about chaos engineering in, in, in particular, because that's what Gremlin is mostly all about, what is chaos engineering? Is it like somebody going and pulling all the networking cables to see how things are breaking? Or it's like you are testing your steering wheels while you're driving. What is it? Yeah, the name implies a chaotic approach, randomness. And one of the first forays into this space was Chaos Monkey, which randomly rebooted hosts. But the irony here is that we don't advocate for a random chaotic approach. There's enough chaos in our systems. What we're here to do is to tame the chaos, to eliminate the chaos. And so like the scientific method, we have a hypothesis. What happens, you know, we think our service can withstand a data center outage. We think our service can withstand the loss of a third party. Okay, let's go verify that. But we'll start in dev or staging and work our way up to prod. We'll start with a very small experiment that'll teach us what happens. And so we're, we're mitigating risk, not creating risk through the process. There are a lot of things, you know, you can plan when you do run these kind of tests. But if you look at the real world, there are a lot of things that happen which are beyond our control. And that is one of the reasons, you know, the CDN went down and the big chunk of internet was down. Those are things we cannot even plan. And these things keep happening. So can you help, uh, help us a bit understand that how does chaos engineering also help us, not in just testing our system, but also prepare us for things that we did not even envision or thought of? Yeah, so I actually respectfully disagree uh, we can prevent uh, the impact for things like fast slaves outage or these third party dependencies. And the way that we need to do it is we have to go test how those failures occur in advance. Um, this, this happens a lot actually where somebody says, oh, I went down, but it's not my fault. My third party service went down. There were two airline outages this week that impacted Southwest. And I heard another one that impacted American and they were related to a third party failing. Well, so what do you do? How does chaos engineering help you? First of all, you have your teams go test what happens if that service is unavailable. What if you cannot reach it via the network? What if it's extremely slow? Do you have any way to mitigate that risk? Is there another way you can get that data? Can you cache that data? If you're not having this conversation, you're just getting being caught unaware. It's, it's a surprise to you. And that's one of the biggest aspects is there's a lot of unknown unknowns in our systems and we have a simplified mental model and going out and actually running the experiments uncovers 
a lot of these messy details that are critical for, for, for things operating correctly. Now, if you look at chaos engineering in general, and if you look at the social or cultural side of our teams, where does the chaos engineering buck stops? Because we are seeing a lot of consolidation and, and evolution, you know, from developers to DevOps to SREs and all those things. So whose responsibility is to do uh, chaos engineering within your team? That's a, that's a great question. And the natural answer is, oh, it's the SRE team's problem or it's the platform team's problem. No, the answer is it's everyone's problem. If you're writing code that's running in production, it's your problem. You have a hand in it. You have a hand in mitigating it. I think it makes sense to begin in some of those lower places, but ultimately the applications have control for things like gracefully degrading or choosing another data source or cutting things off so one bad request doesn't bring down the whole, the whole set of things. The flip side, I would say, or the other piece, that's more the technical side. On the cultural side, we have a lot of folks that have now want to be SREs or have been told that they're going to be SREs. And there's still some ambiguity about what that job role entails. To me, a, a good engineer is well-rounded. They have an understanding of performance and reliability, customer experience, you know, good software engineering practices. So ultimately, I think chaos engineering is something everyone should get a taste of. It should help you in how you design your software, how you think about these problems up front. And it doesn't need to be your full-time job. You know, I've seen a lot of value in doing this an hour a week or an hour a month. And that saving teams or myself dozens and dozens of hours down the road, especially hours in the middle of the night. As we were discussing earlier, and you said, you know, it is planned, it's name says chaos, but there's no chaos there. So when we do talk about SREs, you know, but they are still, we are still moving toward consolidation. We still have silos, you know, not that strict silos, but we do have. So do you have any playbook that when you do plan these, how, what kind of, because once again, we are going through the social aspect of it, how to communicate it to the teams. I will also talk about the higher hierarchy of the organization, like middle level, how much they are CEOs or CIOs, how much they understand the importance of chaos. But let's talk about this aspect, how you should plan your, outage so that the teams are prepared. Yeah, a lot of these teams meet for the first time in an outage and preparing a place for people to have a discussion when things aren't on fire is critical. It's a high tension moment in the middle of the night when we're just trying to fix it as fast as we can. And no one wants to be the source of the problem. And that's not the best social situation. So I advocate for teams should be doing this on their own first, so they're comfortable as a team. But then once a team is comfortable or a set of teams is comfortable, we get them together and we test the larger system. And as, as you're alluding to here, and, and again, a great question, a lot of that value comes from getting those folks in the room. What are your expectations? What should happen if this fails? What is the right calling pattern here? Whose job is it to back off or whose job is it to handle these types of things? And I think that's a, a healthy discussion. Let's talk about the awareness about chaos engineering. Uh, not only awareness, but what trends you see from the higher level, is it trickle up or trickle down? What kind of approach is there in the, in the market? To be able to be successful, most companies need both approaches. You need the engineers on board that it's gonna save them time and it's going to help them build better code. But just like security, you need executives to understand that this is an important risk for them to mitigate. And it may not be the most important feature for them to ship, but if you ship that feature and it breaks, you've got egg on your face and things didn't go the way you planned. And so a lot of that becomes talking about it in terms of the business understands. We want to go from three nines to four nines. We wanna go from eight hours of outage to an hour of outage. Well, what does seven hours of outage cost the business in terms of revenue? <clears throat> we would probably have dozens or hundreds of engineers involved in those seven hours of outage. How expensive is that to the business? And what's the impact to our customers when we launch something and it fails or it doesn't work the way they expected? And so I think once you help them to understand that, help them to understand that there's also a solution. Uh, that's that's another part is, hey, failure occurs. We know it's going to occur. We do our best, but sometimes we just hope. And that's where that, you know, that's where we're able to bring our expertise. Hey, we ran into this problem at Amazon in 2009. And what we sat, decided was we needed to find a new approach in order to get over this hump and in order to make that gain. And that was really that for me, that's where this all began. 
you're talking about Gremlin and way, you know, how you are prepared. But I also want to understand a bit more about with new technologies, whether it's you're talking about technology, technology, or you're talking about the social aspect of it. Uh, the team should be prepared for it. So a lot of training goes there. Uh, so I also understand if you can share some details on what kind of programs are there to kind of, you know, like learning something is easier, but putting it in practice is difficult. And then knowing that you're actually certified to do that thing is even more complicated. So talk about this aspect of uh, chaos engineering and what is Gremlin doing in this space? Yeah, I mean, your, your comments on the social versus the technical are very apt. How do you train those teams to carry a pager and look at dashboards and be comfortable when things fail is different than how do you, well, it's a different, it's a different approach than how do you go harden the team or harden the software technology and make sure that it works well. And so we've been, you know, in the beginning, we're engineers. We're like, look, we want people to figure out the best way. We don't want to tell them. We want to learn from them. And what we found a couple of years in where folks were hungry for some more guide, guidance, some more advice. And so this past, uh, just recently, we launched our new certificate program, which was a lot of effort over the last few years to take all of the important details and learnings that we'd had in rolling out chaos engineering across large organizations and putting it into a format that was easily digestible and could prove to folks that they had that expertise. And I think just to expand upon that, one thing that's really important is chaos engineering is a little bit scary to some folks, to some CIOs, to some organizations. The idea of breaking things on purpose upfront can make people nervous. And so when you introduce some authority, uh, some expertise, when you give people an opportunity to prove that they're not going out and doing things in a willy nilly fashion, that it's good, solid engineering, and that's their approach, that, that resonates well. And that's been our experience. Folks have been very excited about the certificate this past uh, week or two since it's been live. Right, and since you touched upon a very interesting point, that is that, you know, C-level executives, they don't like to hear the works like, you know, you're going to break things like that. So I also want to understand, uh, <clears throat> This may be totally unrelated, just the way we see in the open source of free software world. Free software was the word term that was coined, but organizations were not comfortable. So open source was coined to make them comfortable. So do you see that there is any kind of friction within the ecosystem there that you know C-level executives still get panicked that chaos engineering? No. So do you think you're re, uh, kind of repositioning it or repackaging it, or you think, no, chaos engineering has been established as a, as a practice and there is no friction whatsoever. Some of my customers internally call it reliability engineering, not chaos engineering. And I don't have a problem with that. I, I'm an engineer, I care about the outcome. I care that my customers have reliable systems and that the engineers don't get paged and that the customers have a great, great experience. And so in that regard, you know, chaos has been interesting. It's been exciting. Maybe it's a little too exciting for some folks. I would say in 10 years, I don't know that we'll focus on the chaos piece as much as we'll focus on the reliability piece. Last year was a big crisis because it's pandemic. Things are settling down now. Uh, we have the vaccine and everything else. But last time we also saw that a lot of companies were rushing towards digital transformation towards the cloud because clouds seem like a heaven where they can, you know, still survive. When people rush towards cloud and suddenly now they are settling down, the hangover phase is over. What is the importance of them going in and embracing practices like chaos engineering so that whatever they rushed into, they should know how reliable their systems are. So can you talk about not only the companies who have been doing it for years, but also for the new entrants who just entered the cloud phase? Yeah, I, we're, we're seeing the effects of that pain in the market right now. There's an increased interest and importance around reliability because we've rushed and we've we've lifted and shifted and we've deployed things, but our teams have to learn to operate in a new environment and in a new method. And I think we're stubbing our toes and we're seeing we're seeing the outages pick back up. We're seeing folks talking about it and and feeling that pain. And look, I think the opportunity is to tell folks, look, it's there's a there's a programming joke that uh, weeks of coding can save you from hours of design. And I think it applies equally well in this space. Like 
hours of outages can save you from minutes of chaos engineering. It's an order of magnitude difference. If folks go out and invest an hour a week or a couple hours a month, they can save themselves dozens and hundreds of hours and customer pain and postmortems and outage meetings. And it's not as hard as people think. Uh, by There's ways to go out and do it that, that mitigate the risk and make it safe and allow them to go, go out and begin in a, in a natural way. If you look at all the trends that you talked about, if you look at how the companies rushed into it and they should embrace, uh, if I ask you, and you also mentioned, you know, that more and more, not more, but some organizations also use the term site reliability or reliability versus chaos engineering. If I ask you, what 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 kind of future you see for chaos engineering when you look at the cloud or you know our new infrastructure holistically where things are moving and what does that mean for gremlin as a company gremlin our mission is to help build a more reliable internet and so again that that's our goal how do we help accomplish that chaos engineering is a is a means to an end but the end goal is reliability and so how do we help people number one focus on that how do we help reward people for the good work they're doing? Here's, here's a soapbox I'll get on just real quick. Uh, you can get fired for causing an outage. And I would love to say in the blameless postmortem world, that doesn't happen anymore, but it's not true. But can you get promoted for not having an outage? And if, and if an outage doesn't happen, it's like if a tree falls in the woods, like what's the, how much money did you save because that outage didn't occur? And these are the hard parts that, that, you know, did you get lucky or was it a lot of hard work? The answer in the long run is very clear. It's a lot of hard work and preparation that helps ensure we have clean, reliable systems. And we, folks will recognize that. And so I think we'll see, you know, better SRE combinations between monitoring and alerting and logging. I think we'll see chaos engineering and incident management and some of the, the service discovery or the internal management come together. I ultimately think chaos engineering is test-driven development that goes beyond your local laptop and goes into your integration and production environments. And so in many ways, it may just be viewed as distributed system testing and the right way to write code. And I think, yeah, in, in 10 or 20 years, we'll look back and this conversation will sound a little silly because it's, of course, just the way things are done. Colton, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about not only just the certification that you know you folks started, but also in general, the whole evolution of chaos engineering and what other things we should look at in future. Thanks for this discussion and I would love to have you back on the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Great discussion, great questions. Thank you for the opportunity. Mm -hmm.